Okay, hi everyone. Um, so you know the drill from yesterday. Um, the only housekeeping thing I'm going to say is um, let's keep the standing mics for um, people who want to uh, raise new questions or throw fresh challenges to the audience. Um, if you want to respond to a question that's already been raised or to something that a previous speaker has said, then just stick your hand up and we'll get a roving mic to you. So hopefully that will lend a bit more uh, continuity to some of the discussions. Okay, um, we've had loads of really good uh, food for thought. Um, some of the uh, gaps and needs that people have identified have been recurring throughout the entire conference, including things like um, multiple calls from moving away from surveys and associations to more cause and effect and functions, um, need for better more animal models, larger longitudinal studies. Um, more ecological metaphors have run rampant. Uh, we've talked a lot about succession and resilience and um, how we can use those principles to try and um, make healthy communities more resilient and how to disrupt um, current pathogenic ones. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, a question that came through um, the email address that we put out, um, which hasn't really been talked about today, and I was hoping some of the panelists might be able to address this. Um, it's about the issue of informed consent, and it com comes in three parts. Um, do we need to change how we protect um, subject privacy and confidentiality, and would changes to human subjects policies like, say, the introduction of a de minimis risk category significantly benefit the field? Um, two, how do we do informed consent on uncontacted peoples, who we heard about this morning, and are those people truly informed? Uh, and three, are, are there difficulties in obtaining informed consent, uh, are difficulties in obtaining informed consent major barriers to carrying out microbiome research in children, which we've heard a lot about recently? So, um, uh, Marie, did you have any thoughts on, on those issues? Um, well, I guess the informed consent for the uncontacted is for me. Um, so, we, we adhere to the country policies so, for example, Brazil has decided not to contact the uncontacted. They just overfly them in helicopters, count them from the helicopters. And Venezuela has decided to contact them, sense them, and try to give them health service. So, you know, it's not in our hands as a scientist to criticize or take parts. So you may agree with one or the other. Each one has their pros and cons. Uh, the contact issue and how to uh, ask people whether they want, usually the contact is done to voluntarily offer help uh, from the government, usually the health ministry. So there are, in the case of the Yanomamis, which are, I think, probably the only uncontacted uh, peoples in, the, in Venezuela, at least, uh, there are Yanomamis who are health workers already. So they are the first ones who get off the helicopters and talk to the authorities of the village. It's, it's very common that these peoples have heard about medicine, even if they have been uncontacted, and they are very open to medicine because they have learned the reason why medicina is so famous, they even know the word, uh, is because it works. So basically, the first contact is by another Yanomami in their own language, of course. Uh, everything has to be in, in their own language. And then if they accept, and usually that requires meetings uh, of the authorities, and then they give a village consent. And the protocol is similar even to with uh, contacted uh, communities. So there is not an individual informed consent, and of, and of course, no signatures, obviously. Uh, but it's a process that um, it's done in, a, in agreement, and as much as we can, at least in, in Peru and in the community and in the Yanomamis that are um, from the higher Inoco missions, we try to bring posters and explain what we do, what is a microbe. Uh, it's not an easy task. We have to use a lot of imagination to show graphically and use the translators of their own ethnic group uh, to try to explain them why is it important to study what we are studying and always get their approval. The individual approval is uh, personal. 
it's, you know, a mom that doesn't want to participate, we don't force. But typically they are very open. Uh, and of course everything is done under the umbrella of the ministries of health in any uh, country. So we have to understand that our informed consents in the US are not applicable to the rest of the world necessarily. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any views on that or any other questions? Sure. The, the comment about IRBs often comes up when people ask me about microbiome research. I'd just like to do a poll here just for the fun of it. Who here has an IRB to do microbiome research on anybody? For how many people is this the first IRB that they ever had to do? So still a bunch. And how many people here who are not doing IRB regulated research haven't done it because they're worried about the whole IRB process and heard nightmares about it? So, well, okay, fine. I, that's kind of a loaded question. And the last one, I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I've had people come in, who have come and said that. And I think I was just trying to figure out what, what the rationale is. Do we need to change how we protect subjects' privacy or confidentiality? Because I don't think there's anything intrinsically different about microbiome research, in my opinion, than any other human subjects research that we do necessarily, except that perhaps from the technological standpoint itself, there's a lot, it's a lot easier to quote unquote get involved in it, but you get kind of hung up on the whole IRB because for many of you it's the first time you've done an IRB because normally when you think of human subject researchers, you think of drugs, clinical trials, and devices. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. It's more of a question than trying to figure out if we really need to change our IRB procedures to do microbiome research specifically. So I, I don't certainly have a, any solutions to offer, but also just to, I don't know, make, a, make uh, some other, I don't know, call them aggravating observations. I, I just was, as, as a, somebody watching this process for the first time with the, the HMP and especially with the, the demonstration projects, I just, I found it very startling of the sort of non-uniformity of what happened with IRBs, um, just depending on kind of what institution you were at and um, you know, how risk averse they were. And, and that j it, just, it just struck me as very strange that there, it, lots of people could be funded to essentially you know, go after some of the same questions and, and they'd be faced with different levels of sort of risk averseness. And I, I sort of imagined that if there was some process where there could be sort of just some greater uniformity about how people respond to this. But this is obviously a common problem for any area of medical research. It could be true for cancer research, et cetera. But I just do we have an LC person here? Because historically, there's a reason that they're called IRB and they're institutional rather than being some monolithic government or centralized board that, Kirstie? So I just want to comment, and, and I know a number of us have had discussions around this different, for different reasons, but to add to Vince's questions, how many people here are chairs of IRBs or involved in their IRB as a reviewer? Hmm. So the first thing I'd say is if you're not, a reviewer on your IRB and you're frustrated with the IRB process, I've never been at an institution that doesn't accept volunteers to sit on the IRB. So it's a really great way to improve our ability to move through high throughput analysis protocols in constructive manners. There are a number of things that have happened in the last 18 months on a federal level to try to enable um, more um, conversations between IRBs, and so we've seen that first at the CTSA, but those are some federal regulations. But one of the reasons the IRB process is very different is because different states have different definitions of what constitutes a child, for example, when you become an emancipated adult, how it is that we take care of vulnerable subjects, and so it has to really be left up to the institution because they're trying to do the work in the local setting that they're a part of, and that's actually a very inherent an important aspect to LC research. And I think it's important to remember that when we engage in studies with subjects, these are relationships that we form with these individuals. And it's a trust relationship. It's not just a banking specimens and taking data. They are actually working in the public trust. 
And that's an important relationship that we preserve. And so when we think around issues of confidentiality and privacy, you know, those are the one-on-one -on -one type of relationships we have. In general, IRBs continue, and we've just had this discussion at a federal level, continue to frown upon the idea of basically trolling for subjects, which means using the electronic medical records to survey large populations of individuals in healthcare systems, contact them, and engage them in research. And so I think we have to be cautious as we're thinking about subjects of banking to make sure that we're not doing that. In general, we you know, do give consent, and we do look at issues around who consents for unrestricted future use and who does not, who allows us to recontact them and who does not. And there are very clear racial and ethnic differences, and many of us have published on that before, and I would think we will continue to see that. So I think when we think about engaging people in a trustful relationship to consent them for research, we have to keep in mind all those different variables and that there are state laws that restrict how we can do this from, from a uniformity process. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any other questions, any other topics? Excellent. I have an extension from that. Have anybody, uh, is there any, do any of the speakers today feel there's value about talking about your research to the general public? And if so, have you done so? What was the venue and how were you received? No one has talked to the general public? Well, well, I sort of do for a living. Yeah, right. exactly. um, but but is, there, is there a value in scientists talking to the general public about their research? How do you feel about that? And have, have any of you done it? It turns out Baltimore has a group called uh, Baltimore Underground Science, and I have the opportunity to speak to them. And they're trying to do that. They're trying to get scientists to speak to the general public. But has, have any of the speakers here today done that? Well, maybe I could say something. I was not the only one, but... Uh we were contacted, you guys did a great job in, in spreading the news about this meeting. And uh, I was, and Martin Blazer and, and David was contacted by local TV, TV station to give our you know, take and views on the microbiome and the importance of it to the lead public. And uh, even though I don't speak very well English, I said it was very important, I figured out they probably will just subtitle me and it, it would be possible to communicate, but the idea was exactly that. Uh, NIH ta tax, uh, uh, tax dollar in the system, you need to communicate that to the public, and uh, it was very important. And it was, this, this uh, show is uh, called BioCentury, and uh, will be broadcast across Washington and some affiliates, so I think it was a great job that you did to link the media to, with us so that we could spread the news. So uh, I've spoken with the press uh, on numerous occasions, and I think it's always been good. Uh, I think the public is interested in what we do. It does uh, um, impact uh, their interest and their health. Um, we've had uh, a lot of news media recently with the FMT trials that are going ongoing at our institution. And I think that this is something that not only educates the public, but also brings awareness of uh, the, the new kinds of things that we can offer from microbiome research that's being done. Yeah, I can entirely recommend talking to journalists when you get the chance. Um, yeah, um, sorry, my experience is also, uh, we, especially with the C-section study, that's a, a lot of female journalists call me from different parts of the world to ask me about that uh, problem and what are we studying and why. Uh, so I'm, I'm always happy to do that. And also, we, we were filmed last year in the expedition to Peru by the uh, Smithsonian uh, Institution uh, channel. And that's, a, I show a little part of the documentary there, but they cover uh, uh, as much of the um, field trip and, and, and the baby. So that, that is also divulgation. I think it's very important because that's how we can, uh, in a very efficient way, try to press uh, policy makers to recognize the importance of so certain issues and sometimes take action, uh, support, or make le uh, le legislation, et cetera. So I think it's very important that we uh, keep uh, 
divulgation to the lay citizen. Did, did we have a question from that corner of the room? Well, I just want to make a comment uh, in the same area. I, I uh, totally agree that we do need to encourage everybody in this room to start uh, interfacing with the public, whether it be through written uh, uh, articles in uh, the general press or if it's through radio interviews, et cetera. Uh, and, and again, with policymakers in mind, I, I'm reminded of the gen genetically modified organ organism uh, debate uh, really in Europe uh, where it's really not driven by science, it's really driven by uh, the other side that's really uh, taken uh, a very negative view of genetically modified organisms and since we're going to be uh, putting a bacteria now into people for, for therapeutic reasons and, and I think in some cases uh, the ability to gene genetically modify these uh, in safe ways is going to be important. Uh, we have to start that dialogue and start um, you know, educating the public that uh, uh, these things aren't frankenfoods. They're not uh, necessarily dangerous for us. There are things that we have to do to make sure that they're safe. But um, we need to educate not only uh, policymakers but uh, the public to not be afraid of these things because they are going to be beneficial in the long run. And indeed, it's quite easy to overestimate what the general public knows about this field when most of their experience with it has been through ads for yogurts and you know, similar. Um, the, the sheer depth and uh, breadth of what we're finding out, um, I think, is, is worth talking about. So, uh, so one way to do that is to borrow something that NIH used to do, but because of budget cuts has fallen behind, is set up a speakers bureau where people volunteer with specific subjects they're willing to talk about. It's on the list, and they can be invited from everything from high school science classes to rotary clubs to talk about what they do. And you're not mandated to go when you get invited, but maybe the uh, Human Microbiome Project could set up something like that, which would encompass people from all over the country and offer uh, people in various areas throughout the country the opportunity to hear about the work. So the one comment that I'll make, because I've had extensive interaction with the public um, in terms of the field of the microbiome is I think one of the key things that it's like speaking two languages so that's the one thing we have to keep in mind when we speak to the public um, in that uh, when you are among your fellow scientists and we are after uh, precision and new knowledge um, that when you go out and you speak to the public um, the you know outside of your field you're looking at information that's um, presented as if it were in a textbook. And that creates a problem with communication sometimes that we, I'm going to argue sometimes we don't come across very clearly to the public because they, a lot of times the general public doesn't understand what scientific debate actually means. And you know, it is the natural part of vetting ideas. And it does not necessarily mean we don't have a clue what we're doing, which is usually what it's interpreted as, unfortunately. Um, it means that you know, the information is at a stage where we don't quite have all the details yet, but we know where we're going. And so unfortunately, what um, I think can sometimes happen to scientists when they speak to the public um, is the message is muddied. And it's, I think, really important to sometimes take a step back um, and, and ask yourself the question when you do talk to the public, what's the concept that you want them to walk away with? And then you can be a little soft around the details, but the concept has to be correct and go from there. So, so I, think I, I think it's critically important that we interface with the public for multiple reasons. Um, but we also, it, potentially one service that could be done for everyone here is in a, in a way to learn how to interface with the public um, because it's, it's critically important. Um, there's a new question over there. Two microphones here. Um, so in addition to the knowledge uh, for the public, I'm uh, Bonnie Joubert from the NIEHS in the epidemiology branch. And we have a number of people watching this uh, via video cast from our institute. And one question that's coming up is the logistics of sample collection and incentive for study recruitment. And there's a lot of people that have presented some really interesting studies and have some great samples. Um, and we're wondering if you have um, knowledge about you know, some key incentives for people to get involved as well as the logistics of sample collection, including mail order or mailing, mailing in their samples rather than clinic visits. 
We do that actually. We have patient. We have packets that we send to the patients for home stool collection, and they put on ice packs. But it depends. It depends a little bit on what your question is, and there are some people who are going to be getting together with this idea of trying to create standards for population microbiome studies. And the problem is, sample collection depends on a what your question is and how are you going to try to address it. For for example. A fecal sample that is put immediately into an ice pack and then shipped via FedEx and then makes it in his aliquot and put it into the freezer is good for certain types of analyses, but not other types of analyses. Are you doing, you know, are you trying to assay for volatiles? Are you just trying to get DNA out so you can do 16S surveys, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so again, that gets back to the whole idea of the team science because it's kind of hard to just say you're going to dive into this and follow some standard protocols to allow you to do this type of research because it really involves from the beginning with people asking some very basic questions about what is the overall biomedical question, what types of things do we think might be able to address it, and then kind of build up your logistics from around there. I wish there was just the magical sample kit that would allow us to do proteomics and metabolomics, 16S, do metatranscriptomics, and I don't know, we can name anything else that we want to do on it, and get all the appropriate clinical metadata, put it into the really great program that will analyze all these data, weight them appropriately, and spit out the answer, and it goes on your slide, and that's figure one for your nature paper, or six for your nature paper. <laughs> I don't remember which one you put that one in, one or six, but it, it's, not quite, it's not quite that streamlined yet, and I don't think it'll ever be any more than it is in any other scientific endeavor, so. Okay, another question over there. I have a comment, I have a comment about sample uh, preservation, and along the needs uh, aspect of our discussion. I really feel strongly that we need to think more about preserving live microbes when we do these studies. And um, there are several reasons for this. We talked about not really understanding what's happening in the dynamics of these microbial communities. We don't understand what they're resilient to and what it even means, what perturbations we're talking about. You know, we, there was a comment about 30% of genes not being annotated, and we also talk about using these microbes as probiotics. So to figure all of that out, you need live microbes. At the end of the day, it's just um, sequence not likely to do it, right? So it would be really, really amazing if for every sample we collect and sequence, we also figure out a really cheap, inexpensive, great way to preserve the live microbes. So when someone sees something really interesting in that sequence sample, you can go back and say, aha, you know, that gives me a really interesting idea. I can now go pull out those microbes and see if that idea is right or wrong or if, you know, my hypothesis makes any sense. And otherwise, I feel that we're generating a tremendous amount of very valuable samples, and if we're just um, extracting DNA, we're sort of missing the more interesting part of the story. So I'm okay, does anyone have a quick, any quick response to that before we go to the people who are waiting behind you? No? Yep, there. I think that that's a great question, and the challenge, in, at least for the gut, really comes down to anaerobic conditions, I think, and storage under anaerobic conditions. So, so that's, that's something that is in, it's never going to be as easy, and again, it, it may always depend on the question that gets asked. And we can probably collect 10,000 samples for DNA with the same amount of work as collecting 50 samples anaerobically. Well, that's the current state of the art, right? But, you know, I'm not sure people in the, there are a lot of people doing dry sample preservation, all kinds of cool technologies where, you know, they claim they can do magical things, right? So if NIH or we collectively told them, look, this is a real problem, and if you could solve it, it would make tremendous impact, maybe they can, maybe the tools are already out there, it's just nobody's looking at it. So I, um, we've been working with Tom Schmidt, and maybe, Tom, you might, make some comments because I know you've looked at this issue um, with regard to the samples that we've provided to you. Uh, we, we've, we've had reasonable success in storing the samples at minus 70 in terms of being able to revive uh, strains for cultivation. It's difficult to provide a, 
a value, a, 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 an exact uh, a percentage of how many or organisms are ret uh, retrievable after freezing, or if it's being selective, I assume that, that it is. But in general, freezing has worked well. For the, th sorry, these are for stool samples, yes. OK, thanks. Um, gentleman over there. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of comments, uh, for hopefully for discussion. Uh, so one uh, builds on the statement just made about 30% of the genes that are uh, annotated, say in uh, very well-studied genomes like E. coli, uh, have no known function. I would actually argue that it's much higher than that. We really don't know the biological functions of many more. Uh, part of the reason, too, is uh, that the annotations that are in GenBank right now uh, are frequently wrong. So if you're somebody who's new to the field and you take uh, the function that comes up on your PFAM or Interpro site and says, hey, this is what this uh, gene does, if you actually start doing some functional analyses, you're going to find that many of these annotations are wrong. So uh, that's something I think that as a field, we need to figure out a way to clean that up. And it's, uh, it's a hard problem. Uh, the, the second comment, um, and we've been talking about a lot of new technologies, big data technologies, big data initiatives. Uh, and this is a little bit of a self-serving comment, so there's a, this disclaimer because I think this is a very important uh, technology we overlook, is that we don't really have genetic tools for most of these organisms that we are going to now start studying uh, in the gut. And I think it's an important thing for us to develop. And I think, you know, Sarkis's talk uh, highlighted what you can do with uh, a genetic, uh, uh, genetically adaptable uh, organism. And I think uh, Pete Turnbaugh, if he would be able to knock out his... Uh, genes, he'd be able to answer his question quite quickly. But unfortunately, when I've asked, uh, you know, program officers, uh, you know, in our, my case, uh, we're trying to engineer probiotics, uh, can we submit grants that are just focused on developing genetic tools for probiotics? The answer has, has been a pretty resounding no. Uh, if you want to put a, one small sub-aim in the, in the midst of a bigger project that's taking on a disease, then, then that's okay. But it's really uh, something that uh, uh, you really have to do on the side. We've been successful, but uh, extending this to other bacteria, it's, it's going to take uh, investment, it's going to take time, and the identification of new vectors, et cetera. So uh, I know that multi-omics tools are cool, but I think using some old school stuff could really uh, help us out. Great. Thank you. Um, just before we go, to, uh, do you have a response to that? Uh, to his first comment. Sure. So he commented about um, uh, making sure that we have, we, that we're able to store uh, some of the uh, bacteria samples that we get. Um, at UNC, one of the things that we're doing is that uh, we're collecting uh, mucosal biopsies and we're actually um, uh, getting isolates from them so that as we move into functional analysis, I think it's very important that we think about, you know, having isolates on hand so that we can then begin to ask some of these basic questions, mechanistic uh, questions. So I just want to, to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, gentleman there. Okay. All right. Well, my name is Michael Hurst. I actually have a website, fecaltransplant.org, where I share the story about how two years ago I used uh, fecal transplants to effectively cure myself of ulcerative colitis after uh, coming within three days of ha having surgery. Well, since that time, I've gotten a lot of responses from people who have written me and sometimes shared their experiences and their stories. And there seems to be a lot of variation in how uh, people make this work or how it sometimes partially works and various obstacles they run into. Um, one thing I was wondering was how, from the general public side, can we share our insights and experiences in a meaningful way with researchers so that then they can do research off of that or perhaps provide answers from ongoing or finished research projects? So, from, I'll give you my opinion here, which is that in research, there are, there's multiple levels of interact, there's multiple levels of interaction uh, that from the public up to big science, big funded re, uh, science, and also therapies. And part of that also involves regulatory agencies and Congress and things like that. I'm going to argue that one of the problems that we can face as researchers is that, you know, we hear, um, we're, in general, researchers are optimists, otherwise you would have left the, the, the barn a long time ago. Um, and so, uh, but, um, and so, you know, 
I would say that, you know, we'd like to hear anecdotes of things that, you know, so anecdote defining that as in a single event, okay? And so not as in it's a story that I don't believe, it's a single event. Um, and so those are positive things that move things forward. But to move from single events to the research where we're at, there's a lot of hurdles involved. And I think one of the disconnects that certainly I have experienced and I have seen is that when, is realizing that as we go to do research, so for example, there's, there's a story of a number of years ago when um, the NIH was gonna make a big push to actually looking at various uh, lactobacillus or other based, other types of probiotics in trials and stuff like that. Um, they got the money together, it was all gonna be funded, and then that fell flat on its face when it ran into regulatory hurdles. Um, and so, as scientists, we don't deal with regulatory hurdles, we live with them. Um, and so where do, so regulatory hurdles are there, or regulation I should say, not hurdles, but regulation is there for protection, and that protection comes from um, an idea of what the public wants, which then goes through your representatives, goes through things like that. And so I would argue that the way that you can help us is to become more involved in the discussion, because we talked about how can we talk with the public, how can you talk to us? Well, there's people in the middle, too. And that's, you know, so that's, t you know, talking to your, your, your congressman, your, your uh, um, uh, other local representatives, things like that. So basically, getting a scientific discourse going. Because one of the things that can be problematic in this country at times is, is a lack of scientific discourse that starts from the public and then goes to our level. Thank and you, so, Gary. So, Ed, Ed uh, Lita's asked me to try to uh, steer the conversation yeah, back towards say, gaps, yeah. needs, challenges. So we, if, if we could yeah. do that. We're, we're going to revisit this topic again tomorrow when we hear a bit more about um, fecal transplants. But the gentleman over there has the microphone. So we've heard over the past couple of days about how uh, the cost of sequencing, the cost of gathering proteomic data, everything is falling. Uh, but the cost of enrolling subjects and main gathering specimens, maintaining specimens and the metadata is rising. Um, as a result of some of the HMP projects, many of us have, uh, have specimen archives and data sets that are invaluable and could be used for decades to come. Uh, the legacy of these projects would uh, be terrific if the legacy could include some way to uh, preserve these resources uh, for similar and even dissimilar projects. And there's actually a related question um, that came through via email about whether um, people um, are actually reusing publicly accessible data sets, um, what the obstacles are to doing that, if, the, if they are doing this, which data sets are they using, um, and how are they using their data. So does anyone have any response to, to that? One of the hopes when they set up the normal cohort of the HMP is that a lot of people could use these as controls. And so I had a, a postdoc who had a project where they had a bunch of samples of convenience and were ready to go and needed some controls. And I said, well, let's go get the HMP controlled data set. He came back about four days later, like looking like he hadn't slept at all and was saying, Vince, you got to help me out here. And so we eventually got it. We figured out how to do it. We got it. We were able to use it. It served its purpose well. But I think this has been brought up already, and the suggestion has been already there for Owen and for others, that it's not the easiest way. The processes aren't easy to necessarily get it out. Have you had a similar sort of situation trying to get at these? And also getting the metadata, trying to figure out which ones are really appropriate controls for the patient samples that I have. Um, just comment on uh, there yeah. and then we'll go to Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to say probably the same thing Owen was, is that it's, I think it's important to distinguish in that case between the data and the metadata and the samples. I hope what you just described was the metadata for which we've now, you know, Owen and others have several times raised the, uh, the challenge that is dbGaP, which gets back to the issue of subject privacy and consenting and a whole quagmire. 
that hopefully is not the case with the data themselves. No, it wasn't the data, but it was able to link it to the dbGaP metadata, the de-identified data set too. So, you know, it shouldn't have, and we already had an IRB. So yeah, that's, you're right, it was that. But in order, in order to get to the data, we had to decide which ones we wanted, and that, for that we had to go to dbGaP, scan the whole thing, and go through the metadata, figure out which ones are appropriate controls for our patient population, and then get the data. Once we figured out which ones we wanted, getting the actual sequences was yeah. not trivial, but relatively easy. Yeah. And, and I would contend that's an issue of, of two things. One, what's the appropriate way to consent individuals such that we can share some amount of metadata, which for the healthy cohort we, we can't essentially because of the consents. And two, what are the standards and, and again protocols we need to organize that metadata or samples for that matter. Okay, so did we have me, a comment from the middle of the room? Could I, I just want to amplify off of um, one thing that I was getting from what Phil said was uh, also about sort of biosample availability. We, we are creating these incredibly precious resources, and so maybe I'll do it this way. Um, this, I, I'm guessing this is a no-brainer. How many people in the audience would actually view using somebody else's sample if it was available as, as being a good thing? It would be useful in their, in their research. Okay. So how, how many people at this point have biosamples that they would like to share with the community. Okay, so it, I, I would argue that there'd be some value to, you know, there, there being some type of common repository, or I'm sorry, a, 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 a resource that helped people get access to those, that, that seems fair to me based on that. So yep. I just want to echo that in that um, when we're collecting these samples, not only the bio samples, to collect the dietary data. Um, we pay our human subjects a lot of money so that we can get very detailed diet journals the entire time they're in our study. I'm a registered dietitian. I train um, undergraduates to interview them weekly to make sure we're recording this data. But you can also do it in a less expensive manner. The last section was wonderful with some of the surveys they were doing. The in surveys are very useful for those kind of things. So um, I think it would be wonderful to be able to share these um, bio samples, our fecal samples, but you know, making sure that we include dietary information in that conversation, if at all possible as well, so we can make it more useful. Great, thank you. Um, so one more comment then, and we'll go to another yeah, question. I, I maybe need to differentiate what, what Owen said about the other side is about providing samples that we have and whether we'd like to do it. There's sort of two parts to that. One is whether we have any sort of concern about someone scooping us, but I think the main thing is how you actually do that. If you have one sample and you're concerned about freeze thaw or whatever, or you don't have a person who can do that kind of thing, there isn't an ad gene for samples like this. So whether we'd like to do it or whether, you know, whether we raise our hands or not is actually a little bit more of a subtle thing than whether we're willing to share it versus able. Thank you. I guess I was just going to add one more thing with regards to um, making data available. It may be useful to look at the Women's Health Initiative program, which for 10 plus years now makes both data as well as specimens available and to think about if there's anything in the context of that structure that may be useful to apply to HMP data. Great, um, new question? Yeah, so um, I w kind of want to take it back to the diet issue here for a second. So, you know, we've been talking about having a central repository for mice and being able to have mice that start with a baseline gut microbiota that we know about and understand. But I'd like to push that even further and say that we need to have some type of defined controlled diet for those mice as well as for humanized notobiotics because we, we saw some nice data today where you saw where uh, one community was maintained on a specific diet but not on another. And, and m the mouse chow I'm using in my facility is not the same as what you're using in yours. So there needs to be some more consensus on what defines a controlled diet so we can decide what is really maintaining a transplanted gut microbiota and, and things like that. So I don't know how you all feel about that, but I think, you know, doing this cross-discipline things and including more registered dietitians and 
and people with a nutrition background is really, really important for these studies. Great question. Anyone have any response to that? Respond to your post or should I? <laughs> um, you know, th there's, there's a debate over that, this idea of having completely genetically identical mice on identical chow in an identical cage on identical, can't be corn cob bedding because that'll change, but you know, identical bedding and things like that. I agree that it al that allows us to kind of be able to compare our results, but as we are all scientists, we all look at a protocol and the first thing we do is pull out our pens and go, oh, that's, you know, and you scratch out step 14A, right? That's what we do. But I don't think that's necessarily a problem, and it was brought up with Phil. If we keep track of what is the difference, I think the variation, you know, we like genetic variation. We other, if we can account for the variation and go back when we see an interesting result and then try to tease it out, there's science in that too. So I understand the desire to have standards and everything like that, but at the same time, I think good record keeping allows us to keep track of variation that'll expose more science. I don't know, again, it's a debate both ways and I can see, depending on what you're doing, which one you would fall down on. All right, any more views on the variety versus standardization debate or um, new questions? No? Okay, well. We might finish five minutes early. It's been a long day. Thank you all very much for your contributions. See you tomorrow.